to introduce Michael Moore as our guest speaker today. Mike serves as an SVP technology leader at Truist. He's married with four children, lives in Raleigh, and he sits on several tech boards where he's focused on diversity, education, and empowerment. Um, he sits for the bar in a couple of months, uh, so I know you're super busy um, and you're here celebrating Black History Month with us, so I appreciate you so much. I originally was introduced to Mike through Nicole Hayes and Tom Romano with the Select Group who have worked on some projects with you at Truist. It's always really cool when we learn so much about our clients outside of work that it leads to conversations like we're having today. Mike is going to be speaking to us about Black History Month and what that means to him, the impact that his grandmother Katherine Johnson had on his life, and curiosity and empathy, part of a workshop he conducts on sports and cartoons, lessons in leadership. Curiosity and empathy are two things that build connection and relationships which are crucial to our business, so I'm really looking forward to it. Let's jump into it. Mike, why don't you start with what this month means to you? First of all, good afternoon, everybody, Melissa and, 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 and folks. Thanks for having me. Um, I hate virtual meetings. I'll be very honest with you. I love being in the room and connecting with people. Um, I'm probably a rare technology person that likes people more than computers. Um, and so I'm going to do my best. The first part was trying to figure out how to focus on the camera without focusing at all these people on the bottom whose faces I read to determine if I'm being boring or if they're falling asleep. So I apologize if I lose eye contact with you, it's nothing personal. Um, again, I'm, um, I've got a background in, in I, um, it's been about 28 years. I started off working in Department of Defense, eventually worked in the banking um, and have been in IT ever since. Um, but interestingly enough, it wasn't until um, probably maybe six or seven years ago that I started embarking on really caring about leadership and doing public speaking and keynotes you know, around the country a little bit. Um, for those of you who, who aren't aware of who Katherine Johnson is, and that's true, my grandmother actually didn't become famous until she was 97 years old. Um, she was, uh, I'll call her the Shiro in the movie Hidden Figures, uh, depicted by uh, Taraji. Um, she, my grandmother was um, an interesting person only because she was embarrassed by all the attention and she just went and did her job and never dawned on her that what she was doing was um, anything special, which is kind of funny because she's a been a genius her whole life, but she was cake bacon casserole making grandma to me who just happened to be able to tutor me all the way through graduate school in calculus, multidimensional analysis and physics. but. I assumed everybody's grandma did that, so I didn't know. Um, but I think what became um, when, you know, things started happening, right? Going to the White House to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom, um, the movie and all the accolades. How many um, women, uh, young and old, came up to us sometimes with tears in their eyes, so excited because they didn't know that this was a possibility. They didn't, you know, no, they were not encouraged to chase, you know, science and technology to reach into those avenues. They weren't aware that it was even a thing. And then more importantly, they didn't realize how difficult a journey it had been for women in general and particularly women of color even then. And so um, it sort of became a mission to sort of connect with people and give them encouragement, but also let them know that um, my grandmother never focused on diversity. She never focused on equity. She just really wanted to be good at what she did. And in doing so, she was a beacon and a light for others who follow. And hopefully, I guess that's really the goal for all of us, is to keep in mind um, that while we're in it, our focus is about, um, you know, being better, mastering our craft, um, expanding, um, you know, ourselves and our considerations, but more importantly, um, it's got to be about the place that you're in and, and the accolades, the things come later, uh, but the focus is now. Um, and usually what I like to do is sort of tie my grandmother's journey 
to some aspect of leadership, particularly in this particular case about diversity, curiosity, and empathy. Um, I'm sure many of you will have questions um, about moments in the movie, about my grandmother, and I'm more than excited to answer those questions, you know, as we move forward. Um, but what I want to do is sort of dig into the subject a little bit and tie grandma in as we go along. And then at the end, we can jump right into it. If you have a question, if you want to add a comment, this is not intended to be a high school or college lecture. Um, uh, I don't know how you, if you hit the raise your hand element there or whatever, I'd love to hear from you um, because well, my kids will tell you I could talk nonstop and they'd really like for me to be quiet and let other people talk from time to time. So um, if we can, most we can jump right in. Um, so the thing about um, diversity, and I, you know, I'll be very honest with you. When I first started thinking about it, I, I always assumed it was gender based. Um, and then I thought it was about race and then I thought it was about religion. But but it's about a lot of things, right? It's about. You know, does your staff all come from one undergrad school where you only recruit from? Does your group come from, you know, a bunch of guys from who are all Duke fans, right? I mean, you know, whatever it is, right? you have to realize that diversity provides um, not just a check in the box for HR to stay out of trouble with respect to liability, but it raises the quality of your answers. It raises um, the quality of your discussions, of your problem solving, um, of your um, business objectives, it raises the elements on every level. And so what we're going to talk about really is sort of a brief in this, uh, introduction about um, how, how we see curiosity and empathy and how it ties into leadership and diversity. Um, we're going to talk about diversity and its practical application, not the fluff that everyone talks about all the time. Oh, why it's important and why it really stinks to not have diversity. I think we're pretty clear on that. And then we're going to focus on the hows a little bit about how to tie in curiosity and empathy. And then we'll sort of dig into open discussion. Um, and I'm going to start calling names if you all don't kick in at that point and you don't want me to call your name. So. <laughs> all right, next slide. All right, so so what is empathy? Now I'm going to I'm not going to read you the dictionary definition was incredibly boring, but let's just say it's attempting to see the world from the perspective of another person. Real simple, real basic. Um, it doesn't mean agreeing with them. It doesn't mean, you know, wearing their clothes or their shoes. It just means changing your perspective or your angle and considering things um, on behalf of someone else. And so what does it mean to be curious? Well, that one's pretty obvious, right? I don't know if you were like me, I have kids and they ask me why is water wet? Why do chickens cluck? Why does the sky I mean, it's nonstop, right? But, but you have to ask yourself how many times do you make assumptions about uh, people that you interact with at work, um, you know, personally or professionally? And in those assumptions, how often, one, are you wrong? And how often do you make additional decisions based on those assumptions when it was just as simple to risk yourself being a little vulnerable and asking, hey, just curious. I noticed that you never eat when the sun is up. Is that what, what is that about? Can you explain that to me? I noticed that um, you always wear black. Um, the worst that can happen if you open yourself up and you're honest is that someone says none of your business. Now, is anybody going to really do that at work? I mean, they may be like, well, you know, I'm not comfortable, but it shows a willingness to connect with people, to understand something. Now, if it doesn't matter to you and you just being nosy, well, you get what you get. But if it's important to you because you think it's going to give you a better understanding about how to work with someone, how to get deeper with them, how to get the best out of them, it's important to, to open yourself up to that curiosity, right? Because then it, it informs you on how to function. I was um, years ago, and this is a long, well, I'm not going to date myself, but this was in the 90s, early 90s. 
and I was at a meeting um, in San Diego. We were doing um, a, a conference for developers all over the globe, and they had invited folks out to this restaurant, and it was a, um, a barbecue place. And they couldn't understand why half the folks who were in the meeting were kind of standing off and, and, and weren't eating. Well, this is before we all became, you know, vegetarian aware, right? This is when, you know, you either meet, eat meat or you're not human. What's wrong with you? And so you had this whole group um, of folks who were really on the outside looking in, never connected with the group. Um, and it really was an awful kickoff. And what made it worse is two of the guys who ended up leaving early because they just felt unwelcomed ended up being two of the most de important developers in AI um, about five years later. Um, in DOD, and the company missed out on having them. They actually could have recruited those guys, but the guys felt like they really weren't comfortable, they weren't welcome there, and they decided to go somewhere else. Right now, that's an example of, you know, sort of when it really goes bad. Obviously, it's not always that terrible, but in an environment where we all work so closely together, where um, we really attempt, I mean, you know, especially now that we don't have the benefit of, um, if you can recall, there was a time when you would hire junior people and they would develop over time. Now, everyone that hits the, the, the books has to be ready to hit right away. Everyone's got to be producing. Everyone has to be productive. We all have to, to connect and, and combine as a group almost immediately. And so the better people fit, the better they work with each other, the better they understand each other, the more successful we'll be, right, when we start solving really complicated problems. And so that curiosity to understand how people work, how they're motivated, whether you're in a leadership or management role, whether you're in a peer group, it's important because it informs your behavior and how you incorporate them, how you work with them. Now, the deal with diversity, empathy, and leadership, right, is there's relationships that um, are built with empathy, right? That lead to diversity and then improve the quality of leadership in any organization, right? And so that's where they, I used to call them an umbilical relationship, but that got really corny and then I couldn't figure out how to spell it, so I stopped using it. Um, next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about diversity and its practical application. This is my wife's favorite story because this is how she kind of gets into my presentation. So my wife is a brilliant social worker. Um, she's actually pretty amazing. And I'm not just saying that because she's off camera, it's true. <laughs> um, but my wife is not technical, not at all. And so, you know, one day I'm in here and I'm working, I have like three laptops open and I'm banging my head trying to solve a problem. And it's been about two days and I'm very frustrated. And my wife walks in, who is not a technical person, almost never comes in my office. And she asked me what I was doing and I told her and then she apologized for even asking because she really wasn't interested. But on the way out, she said, well, why don't you just put that thing over there since it's bothering you and turn it sideways? And then won't it look different? And then you'll be able to do that. And then she walks out. <laughs> I'm staring at the screen. <laughs> You genius, thanks a lot. I feel really stupid. I've got a couple degrees. I've been doing this for 25 years and it took my wife who's never seen this before a day in her life to fix it in about three and a half minutes, All right? The moral of the story is oftentimes we got a whole bunch of people around us who think like we think, do what we do, work the way we work. Um, and we sort of push, you know, non-technical or non-finance or non-business analysts out of our way because they're not part of the group. They wouldn't understand the problems we're trying to solve. And here was a diverse talent, a diverse set of skills, someone who happened to be walking by who fixed my three-day problem in about 38 seconds, right? That's sort of the practical application of diversity. Now I take you to, you know, my grandmother. Um, now, for a quick show of hands, who saw the movie? Don't be shy. If you didn't, I won't blame you. Okay, good, good. It's cool. It's cool. Um, if you recall, at NASA, they had a room for engineers, men, right? 
They had a room for white female mathematicians. They had a room for black female mathematicians. And then they had a room for computers. Now imagine knowing how well in an effective high performing team, how well folks work together and how important it is for either for them to either be co-located or have tools that allow them to work tightly together. Imagine how hard it would be if you all had to work in separate areas according to race or gender and could never work cooperatively in the same room or could never work in the same meeting or guys could go to the meetings but women weren't allowed to go. How effective do you think that team would be? So imagine one of the reasons why we were so behind the Russians in the 50s and 60s is because we were still tied to racism and sexism and we couldn't keep up because we couldn't answer questions as fast as they could. We couldn't grind as fast as they could because we were so committed to separate. We were so committed to um, an archaic way of viewing race and gender inequality. We missed out on all kind of amazing accomplishments which delayed us for years. Who knows how much faster we could have accomplished things had we allowed ourselves to get beyond that. And strangely enough, as my grandmother started to um, really stretch and, and expand her, her, um, you know, her reputation at NASA, those walls became to come down. And that's when, if you notice, the USA really started to outrun and outrace and outpace the entire world in the space program. That's not by accident. They started to understand that in order to get the most out of their teams, in order to get the highest level of performance, they had to build high performing teams and high performing teams don't perform well as a monotone group, as a single entity. I mean, they, they've got to build together, they've got to work together. Um, many of you might remember um, several years ago, I think Dove launched a a ad series about the skin that you're in, um, where they had this ad of women who were changing their shirts about they wanted to be lighter, to be cleaner and more crisp and more attractive. And it landed like a dead skunk in the middle of a desert. The market, the, 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 the streets, the market crushed them. How could you be so insensitive? Da, 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 da. Women's groups went against, it was terrible. And then it became true as they started telling the story of what happened. And there wasn't a single woman involved in their marketing group that decided that that commercial would make sense to unload during Super Bowl week. Now, if you're gonna market to a group and you wanna sell to that group, you would think it would make sense to at least have people representative in the group that makes the decisions, that runs the organization, that's gonna, that's gonna choose the marketing plan that's going to choose the budget that's going to choose the target you can at least have somebody from the target that would go dude that's not funny dude that's not going to be cute dude, nobody's going to laugh nobody's going to buy that and so you know that's what happens when diversity sneaks its way into the bottom line and impacts the way you make decisions that's what happens when um you don't allow yourself um to be curious. We don't allow yourself to ask questions. And when you're really unwilling to get out of your chair, right? And so I think once I just kind of hit the truth, so let's just go to the next slide. I'm ahead of myself a bit. All right, so we did all of that yapping about um, what could be wrong in the world and, and, and what we wish things would be. Um, but let's talk about the how, right? Let's talk about um, sort of what my mentors instilled in me um, and, and what I share, um, you know, with my managers and group managers about, you know, leadership um, in diverse communities, right? First of all, we all lead, right? Whether it's through management, whether it's through philanthropic activity outside the office, whether it's in our own families, right? We lead, um, even if we're the oldest sibling. We're always leading somebody somewhere at some point in our day, in our life, in our week. But to lead, you got to inspire, right? You have to connect and you have to inspire. No one's going to follow anybody 
who doesn't appear to be connected to them, right? You, you've all been at, you know, in the situation at 5, 5.30, you got to develop a report for some genius who thinks they need this data on Friday. And you're trying to drive a bunch of people to go do work, to get things done. Um, and you want them to trust that this is important. Have you created the kind of environment where you have a team that's going to jump jump to that? Have you created the kind of environment where the people that you work with uh, will be inspired to help you deliver? Because right? that's really when it matters. Not when it's easy, but when you have to ask folks to stretch. When you have to get people to push through things that they're not necessarily in love with or they don't want to, but they trust you and they connect with you and they know you wouldn't lead them to somewhere absolutely idiotic. Right. That's what they want. They want to know that you're connected. Right. So in order to do that, you got to change your altitude. Right. And what that means is. Um, if you all recall, when you were in elementary school, the good teachers. Would always get down on one knee to talk to you or they would always drop low about eye level. They would never stand over you. They would never yell from across the room. If they did, they weren't that good. Not if they wanted to connect with you. Now, I don't mean <laughs> go to a. Um, a coworker or or a direct reports office and 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 drop down to a knee and look at them in your eyeball. But what I mean is understand that there's an altitude corresponding. You know, if you're on the 80th floor and people that you work for are on the 14th, walk your happy tail down to the 15th floor and go see your people. And stop sitting behind your desk and leaning back like I'm doing right now talking to you all. Um, and thinking that dictation is is how you communicate leadership, right? Um, change your altitude, go to where they are, right? Get mobile, as my grandmother would say, right? That means, you know, in this day, I guess it is get on the phone or get on virtual meetings, but it might mean walk down the hall. It might mean pick up the phone instead of send an email. Just change the way in which you you deliver messages, you deliver information and get closer to people, not because, you know, you necessarily want to be friends, but because that's how you understand and identify who understands what you're talking about, who has issues with what you're saying, and that's how you avoid conflict. That's how you deal with, you know, we've all been in meetings, you're talking to somebody and their body language says they can't stand what just came out of your mouth. Well, maybe, you know, that's an opportunity to say, Jim, Karen, Tom, Jane, whatever, um, let's talk after the meeting. I get a feeling that that's not that's not landing with you, right? Um, it's important to move, right? It's important to now. I'm not saying blow the company's budget and get on a plane every time you want to have a meeting with somebody, but I am saying there's nothing wrong with coffee. There's nothing wrong with taking a walk on the third floor, going from cube to cube. There's nothing wrong with calling a customer if if you've got client relationships. Not to deliver bad news, or ask them for more money, or ask them for another head count, but just check in and find out if you're delivering. Check in and find out are there any issues that need addressing before they become a problem, right? And they might just be unbelievably thrilled to know that you care enough to connect when there's no real money on the line. You're just trying to build that relationship, right? And connecting doesn't mean agreeing. I, I know oftentimes the fear is when you when you connect on a personal level with folks, they rope you into something and now you're stuck either having to agree or disagree. Um, but that's okay. Connecting doesn't mean you approve or agree. It just means you've heard them. They feel heard. And so whenever decisions are made or when um, things have to be determined, they don't feel like they're being dictated to even if they are. They feel more like you heard them, but another choice was made. And at least they had a part. At least they had an opportunity to have their voice heard. And that's another important thing really about diversity is oftentimes it's, it can be diversity of thought, diversity of opinion, um, diversity of ideas. Uh, we all know that one person in every group always has this weird idea that no one ever thinks is a good one. <laughs> but at least they got to tell everybody, right? And that's the way to keep a team engaged and keep folks focused. Next slide, Minister. So, all of this stuff is really sort of gets you to consider a 
especially at a time now where, you know, COVID has probably really exacerbated a lot of this. People don't really feel connected to their management structure. They don't maybe know what the company's objectives are. They don't necessarily get to see and talk to their clients face to face. And so there's this experience of sort of feeling a little isolated and not really knowing how to reconnect if you're like me. Um, that people connection is part of my secret sauce. It's the thing that helps me be successful. And so being virtual has really been a, a thorn in my side. It makes it hard to be effective for me personally. So I've got to get mobile. I've got to be creative. I've got to find other ways um, to connect with people and make them feel affiliated and associated. Um, when you're recruiting, when you're out connecting with folks, um, you know, one of the easiest ways to get people to plug in is to ask questions. Um, and so to that point, um, I'm open to them. Thanks, Mike. I'm looking at yes, let's open it up for questions. Who are you looking yeah. at? <laughs> I was looking at George, but I'm gonna give him a break and wait and see if someone else has a question. No, no, no. I'm off. I'm not muted anymore. I'm live now. All right. <laughs> hey, we appreciate you carving out uh, some time sure. for TSP. This this has been great. Uh, two questions, one more serious than the other. So, um, you know, in that in that situation where your wife walked in, uh, she's not technical. She told you to turn it this way, do this, do that. Did you go back and did you own it? Did you did you give her the kudos that that was necessary, or or did you put that in your back pocket and keep that to yourself? Or oh no, 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 no! <laughs> I ran her down. You didn't tell I her. I ran her down. Yeah, I told her. You did. I told her a couple times. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Because uh, if I didn't, she was going to walk by and see I had it the way she liked it. She never let me live it down. So I figured I might as well. <laughs> Smart man. Uh, yeah, so more, more serious question on, on the curiosity topic. It's actually come yeah. up before in, um, in other discussions, just like how early, how early on is it appropriate to start asking questions, right? You know, there's, there's a little bit of a balance. Sometimes, you know, questions too early can maybe feel, have the other person feel a little standoffish, maybe a little defensive, maybe, maybe you need to build a little relationship first. What's, What's your opinion on, you know, proper time to start asking questions and really learn about the other person? Very good point. Um, there will be an organic time, right? Um, but if you want to speed that up, I find that the best way um, is to be vulnerable first, right? To express a fear, an issue, or something that you might, you know, be afraid or, or a little apprehensive about. I think one of the things that um, it's just like anything else. Most folks just want to see one person go first, and then they feel a lot better about it. And since you're in a position of leadership, they're going to be inclined to take your lead in knowing when they can break in. Right? Obviously, you don't want to say, "Hi, how you doing? I'm Mike." Hey, how come you only eat chicken? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of goofy, right? But, um, <laughs> yeah. I think showing vulnerability first will bring a relationship to whatever level of buoyancy it needs to be. And sometimes, you know, that opportunity is not there yet, right? You build those. One of the things I do is once a month with everybody that reports to me, I do a half hour one on one. Um, and it's broken into three sections. The first one is personal. If they want to bring up anything, the kids are driving them nuts. They just got a new car. Um, the dog won't sit, whatever. I mean, it's it's the, it's their 30 minutes. It's not mine. It's theirs. And that's also in the spirit of servant leadership, right? Mm -hmm. The next 10 minutes are executive, corporate, or team issues that I need to share with them to inform them about something they need to know, whether their, their business alignment has given me feedback that they'd rather something happen one way than it's been happening, whatever that is. Um, or some corporate information I need to deliver, something about updated reviews or something like that. And then the last 10 minutes is about personal development, areas they want to look into, things they want to change about their role, um, training they want to go after, right? 
And then, but the whole time I let it be known that the 30 minutes is theirs. I just asked to let me borrow the 10 in the middle. And then the whole rest of the time is theirs. And I bet you after one or two of those sessions, you'll find whatever your comfort level is with that individual about how then you can progress into, you know, more curiosity. You can even use that session if you like. Yeah. Um, depending on you, you'll get a sense. I think after one or two of those sessions where the tolerance level is for small talk and some folks listen, they're not interested. Okay. I'm, that's their call, not yours. That's their call, especially in your position of leadership. That relationship is theirs, right? You're available to them, right? Your job is to remove obstacles to help them be successful and be available. It's great feedback. I'm sure a lot of us here on this call, a lot of takeaways with that response. Thank you, Michael. Oh, good. Thank you. I don't know if it's say much that's useful, according to my wife, so I'm glad yeah. about that. <laughs> Anybody else? It could even be about space. I don't know that much about it, but I know what grandma told me. Rocky dropped a question in the chat. Um, okay. I think that for her. What do you think is the biggest reason a leader struggles to be vulnerable or empathetic? Hmm. There's two answers. I think the first one is they're a little apprehensive because they're afraid um, other people might think they haven't deserved where they are. They almost feel accidentally in leadership and they're fearful that folks will figure that out. That's one. I'm being honest. It's straight between the eyes. I think the other one is um, that they haven't realized um, that leadership, being you know a manager, a leader, that is a different career um, path than what they did before that job. And so a lot of times they're still holding on to the competitive aspect of what they used to do. For instance, I'm, I'm an engineer. All right, for example, I was an architect. And so when I was an architect, you know, I architected things, right? Well, see, now I'm a director of architecture. I don't do that anymore, right? And so now as a director of architecture, I use a whole different set of muscles, right? My job, again, remove obstacles, help other people be successful, um, encourage them, help guide their careers. I'm not an architect anymore. And sometimes we get caught up, I think, in still proving to the team that we manage that we're capable of doing what they do. And so we're always in the middle of what they do. We're always, I won't even call it micromanaging. It's just not realizing that we just don't do that anymore, right? And so once you realize that you don't do that anymore, I don't think you're as tied to that competitive spirit that makes it necessary for you to always be right, for you to always be superior in your perspective. And then you can be humble and be wrong. I know I'm the boss. You know I'm the boss. I don't have to keep reminding you I'm the boss every day. I don't need to keep reminding you that if you don't make me happy, we're going to have problems on your reviews. Those things are inherent. Stop being small. Stop feeling like you got to provide proof every day that the folks that report to you need to be reminded that they report to you. And relax. You have the job already. Right? Your job is to help them, not to remind them that you run the show. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Wherever you are. Yeah, that was great. I hope that's what Rocky was looking for. <laughs> if not, I got other answers are probably not as straightforward. Yeah. I think it was great. I could definitely relate. What other questions? Hey, Mike, Michael, uh, this is Zach here. Appreciate hey, your presentation. Zach. Really enjoyed your presentation. Very genuine and authentic. It was, it was, it was awesome. Um, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. So I guess I'm going to start with a statement and then maybe turn it into a question and, you know, see if you agree and, and maybe uh, you would kind of slightly disagree, which would be which would be perfect. But thinking about being vulnerable, mm -hmm. being empathetic, I'm sure in your role, you've got salespeople, vendors coming to you for business of some type. In my mind, these traits are just as important in the sales function where you think you have to have all the answers and you think you have to be like confident and you know, aggressive and, you know, know it all where in right. actuality, in my experience, being able to 
be authentic and say you don't know what you don't know or ask that next question to learn more before you start selling something can be very important. So I, I think just for some folks in this audience, <clears throat> I'm just trying to make that that correlation between this isn't just leadership and, and kind of working within right. our internal environment, but actually the same the same types of approach, uh, the same type of approach and same type of mindset with the vulnerability and, and having empathy and and everything you've shared. I think resonates, resonates with all people, uh, even even kind of the, the companies and the clients we're spending time with. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the thing is, think about this. You know, I said before, we all um, are in different areas of leadership at different points. A salesperson is in leadership with a customer, right? You're leading me through your organizational, uh, through your product line, through your, through your uh, portfolio. You're leading us through your your catalog, right? Your solution set, what you can do for us. Um, but also to your point, I be honest with you, I'm I'm rough on vendors, and that's just is I'm, I'm a dinosaur in the IT business, but I'm rough on them for a reason. Um, so this goes to my the ser I write an essay series called Sports and Cartoons: Life's Lessons in Leadership. And one of the cartoons I refer to is if, and I'm gonna date myself, there's a Bugs Bunny cartoon of the uh, sheepdog and the coyote. Um, some of you remember, um, they're the best of friends. They hang out on the weekends, their wives hang out together. They, they eat and dine and party together. But on Monday morning, they both go um, to, to, the, to the shipyard. I think it's a shipyard. It's a, a facility and it, oh, I know what it is that the sheepdog is responsible for guarding the sheep and the coyotes hunting for the sheep. So as soon as the whistle blows, the sheepdog starts beating the crap out of the coyote like all day long. At lunchtime, they take a break. They eat lunch together. And when lunch is over, the whistle blows again and they go back to scrapping. And then at the end of the day, they ride home together. Their wives see each other. They hang out for the weekend and they start it all over on Monday. We've all got a role to play, right? I represent my organization and helping them make the kind of decisions they need to make to make the best use of our dollars and stay online with our objectives, right? And our, our mission and our vision. Your responsibility to your organization is to do the same thing. And part of your mission and vision is to sell products to clients, right? And so we can personally like each other, have a good time, enjoy it, even play golf on the weekends, but we both got roles we have to play to support and manage our client. My client is the business, your client is your business, plus each other. Um, what I like about vendors is when they give me a single point of entry, right? My relationship is with you, right? And so when I call you, when I talk to you and ask you a question, don't sick me on somebody else that's in your organization. Don't bring some other person I got to break in. I don't want to deal with them. I'm dealing with you and actually you're probably lucky because two of you, I wouldn't want to deal with. One is great. I want a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so I, I would, I'm not speaking for everybody in my position, but what I really like is a representative of an organization that masters the navigation of their org and becomes a single entry for me. Now, if I ask for specialty, they'll go get them. But even in that meeting, they drive that meeting. They don't like turn it over to this person who doesn't even know me. And they're starting to tell me what I absolutely have to have. And be quiet, you don't even know me. I ain't gonna tell me what I have to have. You have no idea. And then I turn to you and go, why don't you bring this guy in here, right? And so if I will provide some guidance, it is, it's your relationship to manage. Manage it well and make sure that you protect me from your organization as I'll protect you from mine. I just gave you secret sauce. Bro. <laughs> you, you saw me taking notes. I, took, I got my <laughs> down everything. Man. Sure. Are we good on time, Melissa? Because I don't want to. I don't want to quit. If if folks got, we could talk about anything. It doesn't have to be limited to this. We can talk about the Yankees. We could talk about football. Well, no, we can't talk about football. <laughs> we are good on time, so yeah. Okay, good. Question to answer some of the questions that some people are usually shy about. And I'll go back to the movie briefly. Um, the movie is not 100% accurate. There are some things that were um, added 
for effectiveness. For instance, uh, my mom was not nine years old when my grandmother was married. Um, and my grandmother was never stopped by the police in her carpool on the way to work. Although it did happen to women at that time, it didn't happen to her. And interestingly enough, my grandmother herself was never forced to ride a bicycle to the other side of Langley Air Force Base to go to the colored bathroom. But all the women were, to be very honest with you, my grandmother was incredibly light. And as a result, many people sometimes were confused whether she was white or black. My grandmother being very practical and very confident said, if I have to go to the bathroom and there's one right across that hall, I'm not asking anybody anything. I'm gonna use the bathroom and then I'm gonna sit back down. But the story in and of itself is true. And Kevin Costner's character was actually a combination of three different people combined into one. And no, he did knock that he did not knock down the colored only bathroom sign at NASA. They didn't have any. Um, NASA very shortly after that had been integrated, but during that period of time, it was still quite segregated. I'm trying to think what else? Yes, John Glenn did say, and I got to hear it from his wife directly, he would not go up in the aircraft until my grandmother would guarantee that he was going to come back and where he would land. Back then, the mainframe only went to six significant digits, and my grandmother actually went to nine. And she still bragged about that till her last day. <laughs> I saw that in one of the videos that you sent as well. That was really cool that he wouldn't go up, and he only would go up once he saw what your grandmother did by hand and didn't yeah. trust the system itself, which was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the thing that really, um, blows my mind and I don't know if people realize this but the original all of the original software developers in this country were all women um, early on in the infancy you know men engineers were too busy to write code and develop right then engineering was was the job the highly paid job the one that was exotic and wonderful and attractive and they treated software developers um, and mathematicians like they treated secretary polls in the 50s. It was women's work and they put women in those rooms and they'd go get them to do that little bit of math stuff, whatever they were doing, and they'd let the engineers get back to business. Women wrote the mainframe operating system, women wrote COBOL, um, and women designed the initial operating systems for the IBM mainframe. Uh, look up the ENIAC 6 when you get an opportunity. Um, it's a great story. Um, and what it tells you is um, there are no limitations except the ones we place on them. And our talent is everywhere, not just where we thought it should be. Um, needless to say, if you recall also in the movie, um, Ms. Vaughn taught herself Fortran and became the expert in, the, in NASA data center. Now, I don't know about you, but I took Fortran and I took it with a PhD um professor and i still had trouble with <laughs> she taught it herself to herself i don't know if you can understand how complicated that is but that's serious business and she became the expert um, that's pretty impressive so imagine how much talent how much capability we've missed out over the years because we determined certain folks didn't belong in certain roles Mike, Kelsey had dropped a question in the chat on yeah. what was the best advice that your grandmother gave to you? Oh, I once broke up with a girlfriend in college. She told me I'd find another one, but that is most useful, but it probably wasn't the best. Um, she had a quote that said, you're no better than anyone else and nobody is better than you. That's probably my favorite one. Only because that's the one that seems to resonate with others when they read the book or when they watch the movie or, you know, if they've, they've seen a biography about it. Um, I think about the fact that um, when my grandmother was born, they hadn't invented sliced bread yet. And she was still riding a horse and a buggy. And when she died, um, she had um, 
received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and um, had a movie done about her. And had done calculations uh, when I was um, in graduate school and I called her about the Mars. I think Mars had just landed another um, module and they were orbiting and taking samples. And she was like, I remember doing that. She had done the calculations for the last two Mars missions um, and they had been sitting on the shelf um, since the 70s. And the fact that they're still using my grandmother's work, um, you know, 40 something years later, 40 years later, I guess, um, is a testament to the fact that she only wanted to be good at what she did. She wanted to work on a craft and she didn't care about the, the accolades or anything else. She just wanted to be good and she wanted to be right. And I think that's what she loves so much about math is there is no ambiguity and there's no gray space. There is no almost. It's either on or it's off. It's binary. You're either right or you're wrong. I think she liked that a lot. Unlike leadership. No, I'm scared. <laughs> Mike, this is Rocky again. I have a quick yeah. question. Um, I know you talked about just the differences in between like reality and the movie. And I, mm -hmm. I watched the movie, I also loved it. Um, but one of the responses that I saw a lot to the movie was a response that happens a lot with a black cast movie where it's like the white savior complex. And you kind of mentioned mm -hmm. the difference between reality and like he didn't knock down the sign. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that from the movie and other movies like The Help that kind of have something similar. Right, well, I will say this. The gentleman that Kevin Costner portray my grandmother loved him he came to all of our weddings he was family I mean he was you know our people and so in that particular movie there, there's a lot of accuracy I, I, and I get your point about um about white savior and that that's probably the case for women in corporate America as well as people of color right but the reality is this there's one power structure that is control that is in control of the gate, right? And more often than not, that's the group that's more commonly represented in leadership, right? Now, I'm not saying that necessarily extends to movies, but there's a reality to that, right? I mean, if you want to play on a basketball team as one coach, and nine times out of 10, that coach is a white guy, that's the reality of things. But that doesn't dictate how that white guy is going to lead. That doesn't dictate the kind of way they're going to recruit their talent or the kind of human beings they're going to be. They got choices like we all do, right? And you can either choose to lead in a way that inspires people to be great, to go beyond their, 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 their minimum capabilities, or you can choose to run an organization as dated in 1955. But I have news for you. You're only delaying the inevitable if you choose the 1955 option. Why not be a hero? Why not raise a high performing, unbelievable team of folks that can't wait to grind for you, to work for you, to put in extra hours for you? Because they know if they do the work, if they represent well, if they perform well, they'll be rewarded and they'll excel and they'll grow. And none of that stuff has anything to do with gender, color, size, height, religion, or anything else. It just doesn't. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it did. Thank you. OK. You got something in the chat, Melissa? I see you reading. I was checking. I don't see any additional questions. OK. All right. CJ sent one. Well, OK. Yeah. Hey, this is CJ. Thank you so much for leading this for us. I was curious. You talked a lot about the legacy that your grandmother left, which is obviously amazing. What is one thing that you want to leave in your personal legacy? Oh, nice. That's a good one. I'm almost there. I got it. So when I was um, promoted to um, director at, at the bank, 
and hopefully nobody on the bank is on to hear this. Um, I was asked, and I won't say who asked me, you know, was I excited, right? Because you know, obviously there's a there's a monetary shift, right? And there's a, um, a hierarchy thing and title and all that other stuff. You know, I guess they were really inquiring, was I excited about all the things that came with it? And I said, yeah, um, I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about it. But not as excited. Um, as I am knowing that now, um, for the first time in however many years, 100 or whatever, um, when a young female or, or a person of color walks by the executive meeting room where we meet and do our executive thing <laughs> in the nice leather chairs with the catered lunches and all the fluff, and when that door cracks open every now and then and you can see into the room, they'll actually see somebody that looks like them. And for the first time ever, they'll realize there's a possibility that they might have a shot to get in that room. Right. And for those who have never thought about that, you have to imagine what it's like to go to your whole career knowing there are parts of the company that just say do not enter, either functionally or um, unofficially. Right. And if you want to motivate an organization, if you want to take your workforce and put them over the top with motivation and energy and focus, mess around and create an environment where they feel like they've got a chance at every level in the organization to excel and achieve. You don't even have to make it a fit. You don't have to hang a sign or do anything. You just have to create an environment where CJ or Eric or Nicole or George or Tom say, if I work hard and I perform, um, there's proof and evidence that I have an opportunity to, to move, to grow, to get wherever I wanna get in this organization. And there's no place that's checked off to me. So next time you have a, a town hall meeting and you got your executive team stacked across the top, you know, in the, the, the messaging in Zoom, pay close attention to what you see, not what you hear. Pay close attention to what you see. Now, I might be setting up an organization to have to hurry up real quick and do something, but it's not about all the initiatives and all the stuff written on paper and um, all the rah-rah Sis boom ba stuff that companies do and they want to celebrate their new diversity numbers and how much better they are than last year. Employees are watching. They want to see, right? And that's how you demonstrate your culture. And that's how you you can motivate an organization past 10 if you create that kind of environment where they feel like they have an opportunity to grow. And you don't do that with word, you do that with deed. I think that's it, Melissa. Yeah, we're coming up on time. You want to bring us home? I know we talked yesterday just around optimism, call to action. Any last yes. words? Yes. So I'm a glass half full kind of guy, right? Um, I used to call it, and and back to I guess my my buddy left when we were talking about vendors. I call it my smack hug technique which is, you know, a quick jab to the nose, and then I bring you in close to let you know I still love you. Um, we're hard on companies and we're hard on leadership because we want so bad for the organization that we're a part of to be successful, right? But at the same time, we're in the game. We're on the field, we're on the team. Nothing a kid hates worse when they're on the team than being the only one with a clean uniform at the end of the game. They want to play too, right? And so everybody here, is on the team, they're on the field, they're playing. You can be the change that you seek in the organization that you're a part of. Like I said before, this is not 1955. We're better than that. 
but we can be better than that. Right. And so let's all continue to try to build a culture and an environment that we want to be a part of. Let's try to be the change we're seeking. And let's realize that that curiosity and that empathy makes you a better leader. It makes people want to follow you and it gives you to me. Um, the equity with other folks to have them go wherever you want them to go. That's it. Awesome. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks everyone Thank for you, joining. Everybody. I'll send out some resources and a recorded session after this um, via email. Have a happy Friday. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a great month. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.